Hello and welcome. We're glad that you have decided to join us and listen to our featured Sermon of the Week. This week's message is entitled, Learning to Live with Lions. It was presented by Pastor Henry Wright on November the 5th, 2005. We hope that you enjoy this message and that God will use it to bless, encourage, and teach you while you listen. For those of you who may be visiting us today, we have been engaged in a series of sermons, both for the first and the second service, focusing on the last days. What days? The last days. We believe that we are living in the last days. And so in the second service, I've been preaching and the other pastors out of the book of Revelation. Today, Pastor Boyd in the second service will deal with Laodicea. But in the mornings, we've been dealing with the book of Daniel. And we've been learning much from Daniel. Let's begin uh, with my team up there by reviewing the nine things we've learned thus far from the book of Daniel. We could put those on the screen. I would be grateful. Let's read together because these are key items that you want to be holding in your mind as we go to chapter 6 of Daniel today. Number one, let's read. Daniel is a book for the last days. That's clear. There's no question about that in our minds. Number two. Daniel and his friends represent all of God's people thrust into a world antagonistic to the Bible value system. And we will see that even more potently today in Daniel 6. Then number three we have learned, reading, in order to survive modern Babylon, we must reject the king's meat. That's worldly influences, continue, and have a steady diet of the vegetables and water The Word of God. In other words, what you're feeding your mind on in these last days may be critical as to whether you can stand. A polluted brain will not stand in the last days. Let's continue to learn our lessons. Number four, we learn that the prophetic word in Daniel is God's gift to turn hearts to him. We learn that prophecy isn't just God foretelling the future. The purpose of prophecy is to stir you up to be ready for the coming of the Lord. There's no reason for anyone in this church to be caught off guard by last day events. I'll say amen for you. In fact, it would be ridiculous, given the things we've had a chance to know. Let's continue to learn. We learn that the prayer and trust run throughout the book of Daniel. Real prayer results in trust. Number six. We learn that forcing God's word to meet our will is a common human sin. We got into Daniel 3, where the king tried to take the vision of Daniel 2 and force it to meet his will. And we found out you can't write the Bible to suit your life. You must suit your life to the Bible as God gave it. Let's continue. What else have we learned? Number seven. In our sermon on the last part of Daniel 3, reading... We learned that God did nothing until his people were in the furnace. Have mercy. Last day faith will require us to believe that God will save us on time. In other words, some of you can testify to the fact that God doesn't always tell you how he's going to get you out of trouble. Huh? In fact, sometimes you don't know till the day he gets you out of trouble that you're going to get out of trouble. (laughs) Number eight. Number eight. We learn that God gives us but so much time to hear his call to repentance. And then number nine, we learn from Belshazzar that bad influences can lead to bad endings. Endings. Now let me remind you that there are two stories taking place in the book of Daniel at the same time. Two stories. And in my preaching on these chapters, I've kind of, Pastor Boyd, gone back and forth between both stories. Sometimes the emphasis in the book is what God is doing 
to save, influence a heathen king. That story runs through the first five chapters. Between chapter 1 and chapter 5, hallelujah, God takes Nebuchadnezzar from a non-believing heathen to a God-believing believer. But the other story in the book of Daniel is what God is doing to teach four Hebrew captives that he rules everywhere. See, what you've got to understand today, folk, is that because you may be having problems, it doesn't mean that God has lost any power. The situations in your life are not a testament to how much God even loves you. Because sometimes, hallelujah, he's being most loving when he's letting you have a fit. I'll say amen for you. So, so you can't measure the goodness of God by how good things are going in your life. And the Hebrews have to learn that. And so in chapter 1, the young Hebrews learn that feasting on the word makes them wiser. In chapter 2, they learn to accept God's plans for the future, even though it may not include their desire. In chapter 3, they learn to stand for right, even though it may mean their very lives. In chapter 4, they learn the lengths that God will go to save a heathen. And in chapter 5, they're reminded that God got the whole world in his hands. So God is working on them. These believers, you see, listen to the pastor. Often as believers, we've already decided how God ought to act. And when he doesn't act the way we've decided, we think God has let us down. God knows what he's doing before you get up in the morning. And he knows what's best for your life, Dale Wilson. He knows what's best for your life, even if you don't ask for it. That's why some of your prayers never get answered. Don't feel bad about that. In fact, when you pray, a prayer doesn't get answered, you ought to say, thank you, Jesus. Because his not answering that prayer is an act of love. He knows, listen, listen, he knows that if you had known what he knows, you wouldn't have prayed that prayer. So he loves you by ignoring you. And sometimes I can just picture God up there saying, wasn't that nice? Did you hear what they said? Wasn't that nice? We're not going to do that, but that's all right. We love him. You're not doing none of that. There's one more faith test for Daniel before I get to chapter 7 next week. Next week, by the way, the sermon is entitled, Who's in Charge? Oh, I can't wait. That's next week, though. There's one more faith test for Daniel. He's old now, chapter 6. Chapter 6. We're in chapter 6. He's old. He's old. Maybe in his 80s. Some say maybe in his 90s, Larry Marable, in chapter 6. He's experienced one promotion after another. They first came to, they first came to Babylon as captives. Then they were promoted to the elite wise men of Babylon. And then they were lifted from the elite wise men of Babylon to become governor and chief governors of all the provinces. And then in chapter 5, in desperation, Belshazzar offers Daniel the opportunity to be third in the kingdom. He he turns it down, of course. But then in chapter 6, stay with the pastor. In chapter 6, folk, righteous living does have its reward. In chapter 6... Babylon falls in chapter 5, but Daniel doesn't fall with Babylon. Hallelujah. So in chapter 6, Daniel is still in a good position. But some things begin to happen. Now, now listen to me. Because some of you in the last days, I, I, don't, I don't want you to get thrown. I want everybody that I pastor to be saved. I want all of you to be saved. Of course, I want to be saved with you, but I want all of you to be saved. <laughs> And the thing I've got to get in your head is this. See, sometimes when things are going good, it's just setting you up for the things that are going to go bad. And some of us sometimes, uh, we forget that. We, we get caught up in the blessing of the Lord and forget that He blesses you to prepare you for when He's not going to bless you. 
at least not the way you're praying. So things are going great for Daniel in Babylon. And, 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 then, and, then, and then this text of Scripture. Daniel 2, I'm sorry, Daniel, Daniel 6, verses 1 and 2. Daniel 6, verses 1 and 2. And I think I gave you all the wrong passage up there on the screen. So scuffle, get Daniel 6, 1 and 2. It pleased the rise. Let's read it together. Let's read it together. Daniel 6, 1 and 2. Read. It pleased the rise to set over the kingdom and hundred and twenty princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was, Lord have mercy. He's now on top of the top of the top. Life is good. He's been picked up by a limousine every morning. His shoes are shined and waiting on him. Come on, y'all. His food is fixed and seasoned just the way he wants. He's got box seats at the stadium. Somebody talk to me this morning. The brother is living high. He's over the folks who are over the folks. You don't get no higher than that. Only Darius is greater than him. And he's probably feeling that his Sabbath keeping and his tithe paying and his non-pork eating have really paid off. I'm just covered in righteousness. And you hear him sing every morning, God is so good to me. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Life is going great. We're not sure at this time in Daniel 6. What has happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They could be some of these princes, governors. They could be dead because Daniel's up in his 80s. But what is clear is that the experience that Daniel is about to have is for all of us. I have, I have entitled this sermon, Learning to Live with Lions. Learning to Live with with lions. Now, look at Daniel 6, verse 3. Ready? Read. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Daniel, you already high. And now Darius is going to set you where? Now I just want you to pause for a moment. And I want, you to, I want your mind to just kind of enjoy some memories in your life when everything was just going great. You could do no wrong. Bills got paid, got raises. Not even any mice in your house. Just, 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 just life is just good. Your car starts every morning. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, I've been there. I've been there. It's just rolling along. It's just rolling along. Ah, ah, pastor needs your attention. Pastor needs everybody's attention. Often, often, blessings make you a target. See, God does not bless us just to make us feel good. God blesses you because He needs you to be a visible witness to how He operates. And, Brother Iser, <laughs> good to see you this morning, man. Brother Iser, often, stay with the pastor, often God is doing two things when he's blessing you. First, he's checking you out while you're being blessed. How are you going to handle it? Second, he's letting other folks see how you handle blessings. Because he knows he's going to let the hammer drop and he wants to see how you're going to act then. And he's hoping others will see you not change.
It was like the person that first gets married, you know. Usually people first get married. Usually when people first, usually, usually, usually. Emphasis on the word usually. When people first get married. I mean, you talk to them about marriage. Oh, this is great, man. If somebody had told me this was, this is great. Marriage life is wonderful. They've been married two days. They've been married two days. This is the life, Elder. Somebody should have told me. I'd have been married a long time ago. We need to hear that speech at year 22. I'll say amen for you. Then we know that you know what you're talking about. We cannot, uh, listen, we cannot understand the value of your Christianity until you can talk about the goodness of God when nothing is going right. Then we know that you know the Lord. Now look at the, look at the factors that arouse wrath against Daniel. Number one, he was not a Mede or a Persian. Number two, he lacked any royal bud. Number three, he was connected to, he was not connected to any Medo-Persian aristocracy. Uh, but worse, number four, he was of a different nationality. Number five, different language. Number six, different culture. Number seven, number seven, balcony. Number seven, and last but not least, he had a different religion, a different lifestyle, a different value system. You see, if you're an executive in your company, do you operate like all the other executives who are not believers? If you're a plumber, do you charge everybody like all the other plumbers who are not believers? If you're a secretary, do you waste time like all the other secretaries who are not believers? Why's everybody getting so quiet here? I'm, I'm still just preaching here. See, see, God expects that His people and life situations operate on a different value system. We do right because it's right. We don't do right because we get credit. We don't do right because we get praised. We don't do right because we get promoted. We do right because it's right to do right. And the payoff for us isn't the promotion, young lady. The payoff for us is that peaceful feeling that I can lay my head on my pillow at night and know I have done what God said. That's the payoff. That's the real and only payoff. It was that last factor, the different value system, that would cause Daniel to learn to live among lions. Now, if you will, let me introduce to you the lions. <laughs> Verse 4, here come the lions. Verse 4, read with the pastor, verse 4. Then the, and sought to, against Daniel, concerning the kingdom. Pause, the lions. Learning, oh, you thought I was talking about the lions in that den? Oh, no, man. No, no. The lion, listen to me, the lions are all the people and situations around you who don't like you trying to be right. The lions are family members who've never accepted the, your way of life. The lions are friends who have, who have put you aside because you're trying to do right. The lions are the people at work who see you as strange because you will not partake in certain things. The lions are not the folks in the den. The lions are the people in your neighborhood. On your workplace, in your... Some of you live with lions. Keep your eyes straight now. Don't be sitting up here saying, hmm. Just keep your eyes straight. Some of us live with lions that walk upright. They have brains that reason, hearts that hate, and spirits that growl. And they're on the prowl daily. And the Bible says this lion, this lion den has a leader. Has a leader. 
First Peter, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, you know, folks, we're in bad shape. Surrounded by lions, and the, and the leader of the pack is the devil himself. Seeking whom he may do what? How many got nibbled on this week? Get your hand up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got chewed on, gnawed on. Seeking. 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 You see, you see, Robert, <clears throat> you go to bed at night. And you must go to bed at night understanding, Sonia, that while you're sleeping, this lion is planning your day. Seeking. Whom you may devour. And if you rise up, Sandy, and you don't just you don't just drop to your knees right away, he may catch you before you get out the door. Can I get a witness in this place? Kids get up sour. Or the person you slept with gets up sour. Eyes forward, eyes forward. And you look up, and there's a lion in the house. Oh, shoot, I wish somebody would help me preach this thing. The lion done got in the house. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> there he is. I'm reading now from Ellen G. White, Prophets and Kings, page 539. Here we go. Did we get that one down? We got that one? Ha, ha, look at here. Let's read it together. Come on. The honors... Excited the, and they, keep reading, keep in mind that many of the great incidents found in scripture that excite our interest and thrill our imaginations are literal, but they're also sermonic, I'll explain, they're sermonic. They're sermonic because they teach while they tell, and they become Allegorical to real life. Let me explain. The lions in the story, in the den, are simply the visible culmination of the lions in the story not readily visible. See, he was in the den before he was in the den. And how he stood in the last, how he survived. This is the key sentence in the sermon. How he survived in that last den was determined how he handled the first den. How he survived with those last lions was determined how he handled the first lions. Are you listening to the pastor? This thing is real. See, the den experience, Leela, the den experience at the end of the chapter being tossed there, that really is just kind of anticlimactic. Of course he was going to survive that because he had survived the real lions. Well, it'll sink in in a minute. So, 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 long before Daniel got to the real lions and the real den, he had to survive the spiritual lions and the spiritual den. Now, next sentence, next sentence. I have certain sentences in my notes that I star. This is a starred sentence. Listen. A real believer is expected to wind up in the lion's den. <laughs> yeah, I prayed over that sentence. Yeah. In other words, if you're living for Jesus, you're on your way to the den. Oh, shoot. Yes, sir. There's no escape. You've got to pass through it. Jesus said, blessed is the lion's, lion's den. Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, persecute you, say all manner of evil against you. Yeah, he said, he said, happy when you get there. See, I don't believe that Daniel spent the night pacing the floor. I believe Brother Man was dropped in there, went to sleep. That's how I picture him. 
Wasn't wringing his hands because he had already established a relationship with the lion tamer. So Jesus said, blessed, happy. Matthew 10, 16 and 18, he said, they'll deliver you up. Matthew 10, 21, families will deliver you up. Romans 8, 17, if Christ went through it, then the Bible says we must go through it. 1 Peter 5, 10, it's a process. It's a process. Why is your trip to the lion's den guaranteed? Daniel 6, 5. Daniel 6, 5. Why is it guaranteed? Read, read, come on. Then said these, we shall not against this, except we. That's it, that's it, Alice. Your trip to the den is guaranteed if you are living the law of God. Now, let's be honest. <laughs> Think about those moments. Think about those moments when you wanted to do wrong and some goody good challenges you about doing wrong. Yeah, you don't want you don't want to hear that. Just be honest, you don't want to hear that. When you're trying to do right, you affect people the same way. You affect people the same way. If you are living According to the law of your God, then a trip to the lion's den is guaranteed. In fact, I consider, I consider people liking me because I do right as cream on the cake. That's something extra. Because all through the Bible, I mean, Jesus makes some strong statements. He says, your foes will be those of your own household. Sometimes the lion's den will be your address. So, 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 so the trip is guaranteed. In fact, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, all they that live godly shall what? You know, we read that text, and then we all, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of watching your faces right now. We read that text, and some people even say, Amen. Amen. Then, if you believe that, why are you complaining when you go through stuff? I mean, you just read the text, you, you, you said Amen. <laughs> all they that live godly shall serve persecution. Amen. That's right, Pastor. Well, then, when it comes, shut up. Just shut up. <laughs> just go on through it. Don't call me up. I'm in that text too. <laughs> I got my own problems. Just, that's all. Just go through it knowing, knowing, knowing that when you get in the den, Jesus is already there when you arrive. Either believe it and, or live it. Or don't keep saying amen. We say amen for other people. Oh, yeah, honey, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, we call people up. Yeah, yeah. Heard so and so and so and so. Well, now you know the Bible says, all oh, they that live godly shall suffer persecution. Well, when your turn comes, quote the text and shut up. <laughs> Jesus, understanding the nature of being a nonconformist, declared, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world, finish it with me, and lose his own soul? Now, how does Satan work? Go to Daniel 6, 6 through 8. Daniel 6, 6 through 8. You ready? Read it with me. Then these and princes did what? And said thus unto him, King Darius... You know, just pause. You know, the Bible is very humorous to me. Now, these are a bunch of jackals. They ain't a straight one in the group. Oh, king, live forever. Don't you want to smack them? Just want to smack them. Up to no good. Read verse 7. Read it. Read it. Come on. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, the captains, have consulted together. <laughs> now, hold on. They're lying. They ain't been all over the kingdom and taught all these people. They had no emails back in them days. 
No phones. They lying. They just lying. Keep reading. Keep reading. To make a what? And whosoever shall, or man for, save of the O king. Now immediately the mind goes back to Daniel 3, where a worship decree was issued by Nebuchadnezzar. But there are some distinct differences in the issues at stake in Daniel 3 and Daniel 6. Listen, I'm teaching. Pastor's teaching now. Pastor's teaching. Listen. In Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar's responding to the events in Daniel 2. In Daniel, the third chapter, Nebuchadnezzar's attempting to alter God's revealed will. Chapter 2, via the image of the four metals, indicates that Nebuchadnezzar's own kingdom will fall. And thereby, he thumbs his nose at that by chapter 3, designing an image all of gold. He uses worship to make his point by requiring everyone to bow down to his version of Scripture. That's Daniel 3. But in Daniel 6, the stakes are different. The issue in this chapter is who will worship, who, who, not how you worship, but who you will worship. Not whose will shall be worshipped, but who will be worshipped. In chapter 2, it is to bow down to the image. In chapter 2, it anticipates Revelation 13. It's bowing down to a false God. Chapter 6 anticipates the issues raised in Revelation 14. In the first three angels' message, the angel declares, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Stay with the pastor. Now follow closely. The words of the first angel in Revelation 14 are the same words in Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. So in Daniel 6, the temptation is to enact a substitute for the real. Revelation 13 and 14 predict an attempt to substitute for the real. We today will face that same lion's den. A substitution of the false for the real. Say that with me. A substitution of the... One more time. A... All right, I need those statements now, team. I need those statements that I've got. Read this with me. God and sanctifying this day. Keep reading. As to be observed by... Read on. Thought. Keep going, keep going, team. Keep going. But above God, change, placing the, where the, and the, has taken this child of the, next statement, next statement, read. How does the devil work? He's turning the entire planet into a lion's den. And the lions in it, listen, listen, the lions in it have decided to cast their allegiance with falseness. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to declare to you this morning that you are living in the lion's den. And those lions are creating situations from which it's going to be hard for you to escape. You're going to find out, will you be true to your God? That's the first part of the devil's method. But there's a second. There's a second. The best weapon the devil has against you is your life. Look at the wording in Daniel 6. Go back to verses 4 and 5. But then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not, they could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was what? He was what? Neither was there what? 
Now, is that what your neighbors can say about you? Is that what your non-believing family members can say about you? Is that what your co-workers can, can say about you? In other words, does the devil have enough evidence to convict you of righteousness? Did you hear what I just said? If the devil was building a case against you because of your righteousness, does he have anything to go on? Your allegiance to God, your allegiance to God is the devil's best weapon to put you in his den and his lions have at you. You see, I almost learned, I almost, I almost named this sermon more consistency. What we need is more people in CPC living so consistently that we upset the devil. Now I've got to tell you something, and I don't want to sound like a fire and brimstone preacher, but I've I, I, I got I to tell you something. You ought to be living the kind of life that keeps the devil nervous every day. In other words, you ought to be catching hell because you are attached to heaven, not because you're half-stepping in hell. Oh, here's a question. Is the devil afraid of you? He's more afraid of you than you think. See, he's more afraid of you than you think. Why do you think he's always on your case? See, some of you have not read the Bible. Uh, Isaiah says that hell is enlarged for the wicked. That means that the original size for hell was for the devil and his angels. But now God has had to enlarge hell. <laughs> oh, shoot, I wish somebody would help me with this. He's had to enlarge it because a whole bunch of folks have decided, we don't want the devil to burn by himself. We ought to be living the kinds of lives that antagonize. See, uh, verse 10 says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, when Daniel knew, I love this verse, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, hey, Daniel, they have signed a decree. Oh, have they? That no man worship anybody but derives for 30 days. Have they when he knew it was signed? Now, keep in mind, he's the first of presidents. So he was invited to the signing. He watched Darius sign it. Left, went home. And then the Bible says, and opened his windows. Plural. Oh, shoot, y'all. Have you ever seen a bathroom window? He could open that one. Small. The word used there means actually doors. <laughs> Daniel went home, threw open his doors, the great big picture windows. Now, he could have done that and then gone to the bathroom and prayed. Come on, y'all. But he prayed in the living room. Now, it was just for 30 days. He could have cut back to one prayer a day. Just for 30 days. God would understand. Good theology. God didn't call me to be eaten by lions. He called me to go to glory. I'm going to pray once a day for 30 days in the bathroom and crack that window. We need you to come in the work just for the next two weeks on Saturday. Well, God knows I got a mortgage. Doesn't want me to be out in the street. Don't make sense for a Seventh-day Adventist Christian to be out in the street. I'll go in just for a couple of Sabbaths. Close my door. 
so they can't see me in the office. Do I have your attention? I love it. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows, plural, being opened in his chamber. That's the main room. Toward Jerusalem, he knelt upon his knees three times. Three times! He found three times! He's going to cut back to two! What God needs is just somebody who will just be right every day. I just can't squeeze out that tie this month. God understands. Just bought the car. Be embarrassing for a Seventh-day Adventist Christian to have his car repossessed. Get the payment in this month. Make up the tithe next month. Just 30 days to bow down to Darius. I wonder why it's gotten so quiet in this church right now. We're all sitting there together Saturday night. Somebody pops in a movie that ain't worth squat. We'll be all members of the singles club together at CPC. All of our names are on the roll. Don't want to come across as a fanatic. Just 30 days. Two and a half hour movie of filth and dirt and cursing and swearing. And I'm grown. This man then stopped preaching and going to meddling all up in people's lives. I mean, if I had been Daniel's friend, I said, now, Daniel, you know, you don't need to run this thing in the ground, man. Just 30 days. Let's pray in the basement. Or pray real early in the morning before anybody gets up. See, what I'm, see, what I'm, what I'm, I'm, see I'm trying to crawl inside your head. I'm trying to get you to see, ladies and gentlemen, how the devil messes with you and how God gets disappointed for at the moment when he needs you to be something. You crawl under the rock. Of excuses. Half-stepping. Don't have the backbone to stand for the Jesus who was embarrassed before the whole universe on the cross. Half-stepped naked. And we're worried about the opinions of people. Well, the word immediately got to Darius. He was terribly, terribly upset. Had to bring Daniel in. Spent all day praying, hoping he didn't have to do it. But Daniel went into the den. It's very disturbing to me, folk. Uh, Scott, you read the story. We call it the story of Daniel in the lion's den. There's not one verse in the story that describes anything that happened in the den. Read the chapter. We don't know where they paced. We know the lions growled. We don't know where they gnawed on him all night but just couldn't bite. We don't know. We don't know anything. I mean, I'd like to know. How was it? The story is not about the den. It's about a relationship with God that gets you through anything. So we don't need any details about the den because the Bible's already told me if I go to hell, He's already there. If I go to the mountain top, He's there. So it doesn't. Need, I don't need any details about the den. God can handle the den. What I know is it came out the next morning, and so will you. Oh, yeah. I didn't see you. I didn't see you standing on the sea of glass. A man which no man can number. Number which no man can number. I, I've seen you. A whole lot of folk coming out the den, folk. Every nation, kindred, tongue, 
and people. So don't worry about the den. Don't worry about the lions. Get hooked up with the lion tamer. Live consistently for Jesus Christ. And everything will be just fine. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Father, thank you. I'm getting my practice now. <laughs> All these lions nipping at me. I'm getting my practice now. The den is the world, my house, my workplace. I'm getting my practice now. There's going to be some real trials. We read it. Some thrown in jail, some exiled for the sake of the truth. In the meantime, I'm getting my practice now. But keep your eyes closed, head bowed. Did you notice in chapter 6? Did you notice? I noticed it. <laughs> the more Daniel prayed, the worse it got. Did you notice that? Yeah, he prayed three times a day and he wound up in the lion's den. You ever been in a situation where it looks like your prayers are bouncing off the ceiling? Now listen to the pastor. Anytime you're in a situation where things consistently go bad and you're trying to serve the Lord, that means God is in it. That means God is in it. If everything consistently goes bad while you're trying to do right, God is in it. And that means it's going to be all right. It is going to be all right. Now my appeal, simple. You didn't know you were living in the lion's den, but the pastor told you this morning. Now you understand why you're being nipped at, gnawed on, bitten, bruised. But you want to be consistent. You want the Lord to give you the, the gift of consistent Christian living. There's just too many folk in this church copping out on the Lord on this, that, and the other. I know it, you know it, sitting here, and God knows it. Let's don't pretend about it. You need to be more consistent. You need to have a value system that you don't change with every situation. That's just the fact of it. You need prayer. You need prayer. Get your hand up right now. Get it on up. Mine sure went up. Keep it up, keep it up. Lord, here's what you see. A bunch of people saying to you, <laughs> we, 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 we got to stop being back and forth. Sometimes on, sometimes off. It's too late for that. We want to have the courage to throw open the windows on our life. We want, we want Satan to have evidence to put us in the dead. We're not worried about the den. Daniel went through it. We'll go through it. Keep your hand up. I didn't tell you to put that hand down. Keep it up. Keep it up. You're asking God for more consistency. Now your hand is down. Father, you saw the hands. You saw the hands. You saw the hands. One more appeal. This has to be quick. Maybe you've been thinking about you know, coming and giving yourself fully to Jesus, to His Word, to His church. You're a Bible study student, perhaps. You've never really walked down this aisle. You'd like to do that today. While heads are bowed, people are praying. You can just get up and come down front. Someone will do that right now from the balcony, from the pews. Just come down. Just come down. Jesus, please. Help me into the den. Shut them lines up while I'm in the den. Bring me out of the den and plant my feet on streets of gold. In Christ's name. And the people said, Amen. 
We trust that this week's message was truly a blessing. If you have any questions about the message you heard or would like to contact a pastor for Bible studies, please let us know by selecting the Contact Us link on our homepage. Thank you again for joining us, and remember to check back next week for another featured message.